Good day everyone, my name is Ngoni Mombeshora. Today I'm going to be presenting my topic and the topic name is Leveraging Next Generation Mobile Networks for Drone Telemetry and Payload Communication. So just to start a little bit about myself, um, like I said, my name is Ngoni and I grew, up in, I grew up in Zimbabwe and moved to South Africa to pursue my tertiary education where I did my Bachelor of Science in Mechatronics Engineering up until 2020 and went on to do my Master's in Electrical and Computer Engineering which um, I'm on track to be finishing soon. So yeah, to today as the topic said, we are leveraging next generation communications and the key words in that are drone and communication. So where does this lead us? I'm going to start with a brief overview. I'm going to start with drone communications and what options do we have there? We've got a direct link, we've got satellite, we've got ad hoc network, and we also have mobile cellular networks. So your direct link is essentially just your remote control communicating directly to the drone. Um, yeah, an advantage of this is it's relatively easy to set up uh, but nothing complex there and it's a simple link of, although it does come with some limitations and the biggest of those is line of sight so if your drone goes a bit too far or maybe let's say behind a building uh, or trees or it's in a dense area with a lot of interference you are most likely to lose control of your drone the other option is satellite communications and this gives your drone internet and communication access via the satellite and um, although that is good satellite is you've got um, remote coverage so that's an advantage over the direct link but the drawback of using satellite communications is that you have uh, you've got very complex um, bulky and heavy equipment on board the drone so yeah, you run into your swap constraints, which is your size, weight, and power constraints. So because of that, it tends to be very expensive, very expensive drones, and so on. Uh, the other option is ad hoc networks. And ad hoc networks are bespoke networks that have been set up for like a specific task. Um, the drawback of this when you're using it with, with drones is that they are, again, they are for a very specific task. And it's like an almost... Um, hacky way of setting up a communication to your drone and um, yeah the drawback of this is that you run, in, you run into like very complex routing protocols and ad hoc networks are not transferable to um, other devices and other use cases as well so setup time turns up to be really high but yeah they are quite robust networks and the other option we have is mobile slash cellular networks and um, this is essentially what we are going to be dealing with today so mobile networks you have got global coverage they are available anyway um, although you do like um, they aren't there in some very remote areas but just like your cell phone whenever you're moving from city to city from country to country wherever you are you've got um, network coverage on your cell phone so because of this, um, we are going to dive a little deeper into mobile networks for drone communications. So yeah, what are the problems? So understanding the problems with respect to drone communication, like I had mentioned before, we've got our line of sight limitation. Um, yeah, if your, drone, if your drone goes too far, you lose control of it. We've got our uplink and downlink data rates and this is highly dependent on the drone use case itself. When you're just command and controlling, you're pretty much just flying it. You don't need very high data rates. About 200 kilobits per second is good enough. But let's say you are the streaming HD video, that, that becomes a big issue. And you want a communication system that's able to handle those high data rates. Latency is also an issue. Um, let's say you're flying a drone in real time. You are going to want it to react to your input as quickly as possible you know and it also depends on some use cases let's say you are delivering medical equipment and or you are doing drone racing um, 
latency does become an important factor. The other factor to consider is coverage. And um, yeah, pretty much depending on the use case, again, uh, let's say you are doing farmland mapping or you are doing drone entertainment at a, at a shopping mall. Um, farmland mapping would require very high coverage, whereas drone entertainment at a shopping mall, it's, it's, it's quite a localized thing. So, yeah, because of these um, problems, yeah, like these four issues, these are the main, four main issues. And, yeah, what this ultimately leads to is you've got a limited number of use cases for drones. So, yeah, just to mention a few use cases, um, I've put these use cases according to... Um, some of the limitations that we run into. And some of them, the first one here being coverage uh, limitation. Like let's say you are, you are spraying plants and you're on a farm, you're doing pretty much drone farming or power line inspection. Um, yeah, over here, this is a height constraint. So yeah, if you're doing those first two use cases there, your drone is flying pretty low and it's, and it's got an altitude of about up to 10, 15 meters, whereas compared to upper airspace ins inspection, uh, your drone is high up in the air, and yeah, one might be testing, let's say, um, carbon dioxide concentration in the air, or, or yeah. Um, so, with regards to this, you've got a height limitation, and you need some communication systems that can um, accommodate for for that when you're flying. 10 meters in the air as compared to about 300 or 400 meters in the air. And yeah, hotspot areas, you've got stadiums, shopping mall, that's your aerial entertainment, which is a hotspot area, you don't need much coverage there. Whereas when you're doing farmland mapping or logistics and transportation, you need to be able to communicate with your drone from a, long, a longer distance. And yeah. So with regards to data rates, uh, like I mentioned before, command and control transmission is not demanding in terms of data rates. 200 kilobits per second is enough, whereas when you want to do 8K HD video streaming or AR, VR streaming or video capture, um, yeah, you need, you, you need around about 1 gigabits per second for AR and VR. For 8K video streaming, you're looking at about 500 megabits per second. So that becomes a strong limiting factor on the on the kind of communications you, you need because it needs to be able to sustain those high data rates and, and be reliable at the same time. And yeah, in terms of um, there is also some use cases that are highly dependent on on positioning and accuracy so for like aerial surveillance let's say yes uh, um, yeah flying your drone and you wanna survey a specific area you don't need much accuracy there let's say about one meter or even two meters is good enough for you to see what's happening in a certain area whereas when compared to automatic charging your pos positioning accuracy needs to be you know maybe even within 10 centimeters so these are just some drone use cases and uh, yeah, some of their limitations that come along with them as well. Uh, yeah, so just some images there. You've got your aerial entertainment. You've got drone deliveries of medical equipment. Um, in the picture here, you see Mark Zuckerberg is demonstrating how Facebook just added live streaming from every device. and. Yeah, he's waving at the drone there and it's directly streaming, of course, like um, that would require high data rates um, for you to be able to stream high quality vi videos. And on the right side, you've got your automatic charging pad. So when your drone is landing there, it needs to be pretty accurate on where it's going to land and yeah, make, making sure that it doesn't miss the landing pad there. So your GPS accuracy, accuracy needs to be really good. So why did we go with mobile networks? The first reason is um, mobile networks have an almost ubiquitous accessibility. Like I had mentioned before, they are everywhere, right? Um, 
wherever 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 you are they've got coverage they've got superior performance as well in terms of um, data rates and latency which we are going to get into a bit later um, they are highly scalable and they are based on evolving standards they are highly interoperable and they are backwards compatible what I mean by this is that wherever you are let's say your phone has got 5G and you know you are connected to your mobile network service provider via 5G if you reach an area where that connection is not strong enough or 5G is not available it reverts back to 4G and it refers back to 3G and so on. So, yeah, they are backwards compatible and they are everywhere. And for these reasons, um, we, are, we are going to look to dive a bit more into how we can leverage mobile networks for drone communication. <laughs> and uh, with regards to mobile networks, we are going to be specifically focusing on 5G. And the reason for this is that not much experimental research has taken place or research in terms of using 5G mobile networks for drones. And yeah, 5G has come with a lot of buzzwords. Um, and yeah, for this reason, I've chosen to look at 5G for drone use usage. Um, the first one there being network slicing. And network slicing is essentially when your phone connects to a network, the network kind of picks up the kind of quality of service that you want from the mobile network and it creates a slice or like an instance of that network and then and then connects you there. So it's not like 4G, let's say when you when you connect your quality of service is essentially what everyone else is getting or any other device that's going to connect there is getting the same quality of service. Which is which helps differentiate things, and we can lev leverage this in terms of drone usage. Because, for example, let's say I am doing a video call, right? I would probably need um, very high throughput uh, as compared to latency. It's not as important, so I'll probably get a slice of the network with with uh, preference to throughput as compared to latency. So, yeah, there were two things: are uh, ultra reliable, low latency. Massive machine type communication. So 5G, the 5G core network itself, is is capable of interacting with um, other machines um, using a specific protocol. And it also comes with enhanced mobile broadband. They pretty much make better use of the the available fre fre frequencies and the frequency channel itself. And we are going to get into more about that. This one is my personal favorite, and this is 3D beam forming. So the best way to describe this is using this picture there. As you can see, you've got your network tower, your 4G network tower there. And what this essentially was is you've got your one antenna pointing in some certain direction. Some are unidirectional, but everyone is getting the same beam. So if you're further away, you're going to get a weaker signal and so on and so forth. Whereas 5G, instead of having one antenna, you have what they call an antenna array. And through the process of um, interference, what these antenna arrays do can, can pick out your location where you are and concentrate a beam towards a specific user equipment. So that means you've got a more robust communication line. Um, in that regard so that's really interesting because um, drone communication um, for drone co communication because a drone is is flying it's a high mobility device and it's flying in the 3d space and you always need to have that strong communication channel also considering the interference that would come from your propellers and this and this 3d maneuvering as well so the other one is 5G spectrum and frequency utilization. So 5G is, uh, yeah, um, has made better usage of um, this, the, the spectrum and the frequency utilization. And um, one of the things that it does that is, is via numerology. So what is numerology? Numerology is a technique that also is used to really uh, bring out that ultra low latency. So in mobile networks, uh, we have a thing called a radio resource. And what a radio resource is, is pretty much an OFDM signal, OFDM standing for orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. 
and yeah it's a way of um, propagating um, data over over the air and what what it does is that each radio resource has got a chunk of 12 subcarriers and um, let's say in the example here we've got a 15 kilohertz um, subcarrier spacing and a one millisecond signal that yeah a signal that takes one millisecond to transmit let's say it's a some piece of data and yeah mobile networks up to 4g lte this is essentially what they use and um, now with 5g what they do is that you can change or in increase the number the sub the sub carrier spacing that you use so you can use 15 kilohertz, 30 kilohertz, 60 kilohertz, all the way up to 240 kilohertz. And, you see, and, and as you can see in the diagram there, what it means is that that one millisecond that was essentially used to transmit 14 or FDM symbols um, keeps reducing in turn. So 15 kilohertz subcarrier spacing as compared to a 60 kilohertz subcarrier spacing, you have reduced the latency from one millisecond to 0 0.25 milliseconds. So using this, 5, 5G is, uh, is, is making better use of the, f the, f the, f the frequency uh, bandwidth it has, and uh, also really um, drastically reducing uh, the, late, the latency, hence that's where the ultra reliable low latency is coming from. Uh, so yeah. So that's uh, a, a brief introduction and background. And what am I going to be talking about today? So today I'm going to be talking about uh, the implementation of an SDR-based open source 4G, 5G network for drone communication. And SDR there stands for Software Defined Radio. It's uh, essentially a piece of hardware equipment that um, kind of implements all of the hardware that's required for um, radio technology for mobile networks. So instead of having your big antenna tower and with its amplifiers and attenuators and modulators, all that hardware is now implemented in software on the software-defined radio. And um, yeah, essentially we have we, we get a, a relatively cheaper piece of equipment that can essentially do the same thing as a radio tower. So the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to start with a 4G test bed. So these are indoor test beds that I have set up, a 5G test bed, and then I'm going to talk about the drone setup itself. And finally, I'm going to talk about how I've been able to implement a 5G mobile network for drone communication, essentially. And whilst I'm doing this, I'm going to be giving an insight into the kind of performance you'd expect from a 4G mobile network, a 5G mobile network as well. And uh, yeah, these insights are going to be comparable to your um, commercial mobile network providers. So yeah, what is... Uh, a mobile network comprised of. So here we've got an image of our indoor mobile network setup and it's made up of a core network and an E node B. And E node B stands for um, Evolved Node B and EPC stands for Evolved Packet Core which is the core network of the mobile network. So the easiest way to think about it is that the core network is like the back end and your E node B is your front end. So in the core network, you've got HSS, MME, and a few containers there. And your HSS pretty much handles um, all, all the sub subscriber data. So every SIM card that's supposed to connect in the network is saved. And your MME is pretty much handles authentication. So whenever you connect to a mobile network, it, it goes and checks in the HSS database if um, this this user with this specific number and this SIM card IMEI is, a, is, a, is allowed to to be a part of the network and you've got your base station which is the front end and your SDR there um, 
we are using an ETAS B210 STR from new from uh, new instruments and yeah that essentially becomes your your mobile cell phone tower essentially and the user equipment we're using I was using a Huawei P40 Lite for this and a Raspberry Pi hat a 3G 4G and 5G capable Raspberry Pi hat which is just a, a dev board which comes with a SIM card module and a SIM card slot so you can just um, program your own SIM card according to your core network core network specifications you program your SIM card you program your core network and yeah you just insert your SIM card and it now uh, your user equipment now connects to your um, to your mobile network so from this we carried out some tests and what are some of the key performance indicators that we realized we realized a throughput of 75 megabits per second on the downlink and 30 megabits per second on the uplink a latency of 16 milliseconds and an RSSI of minus 51 dBm to minus 25 dBm so just for context um, for RSSI which is your received signal strength index um, it's just a comparison of the strength of the transmitter signal and the strength of the received signal and um, just for context um, an RSSI value of minus 50 dBm in mobile networks is considered really good and obviously 0 dBm would be would be the would be the ideal value would be the best value and yeah minus 50 dBm uh, RSSI indicates a value that um, your mobile network is is pretty much like commercially viable uh, in that in that regard and from then on we went to set up a 5g test bed you see that our 5g test bed is quite similar to the 4g test bed because that's because the 5g test bed is a non-standalone test bed a non-standalone test bed is essentially a, a mixture of 4g and 5g and i'm going to explain that how that is um, because in 5G we've got non-standalone and we've got standalone. So a standalone 5G test bed is essentially quite similar to a 4G test bed, but instead of having a 4G core network, we've got a 5G core network and a 5G base station. So here in non-standalone mode, we we use our 4G core network, we use our 4G base station, and we use our 5G base station so a 5g base station is added on there and what this essentially means is that we've got two cell phone towers and the way this works is let's say your phone would um, look for available mobile networks that it can connect to it will find this one and it will connect via 4g and once it has connected via 4g your 4g base station will receive user information uh, user equipment in, 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 in information and if your phone is 5G capable it will then transfer that connection um, onto the 5G base station and hence now your phone is directly connected to 5G and communication is done via that so yeah what are some of the key performance indicators um, we have 90 megabits per second on the downlink so the downlink is from your base station to the to your user equipment and on the uplink we've got 30 megabits per second a latency of 5 milliseconds so when you compare that to the 4g latency that's um less than half it went down from 16 milliseconds to 5 milliseconds um so yeah that's also like that that low latency that i was talking about when it comes to to the implementation of the 5G mobile network and uh, we've got the same RSSI uh, reason being that channel communications are the same um, transmit power for the base stations are the same as well and just for comparison um, I've compared my test bed to some of the commercial mobile network suppliers here in South Africa and yeah, so for our test bed, you see that our 4G test bed 
is performing much better than um, a commercial mobile network. In this case, I was using MTN, whereas we've got a downlink of 75 megabits per second as compared to the 40 megabits per second. In the uplink, um, the throughput was the same, and you will see that the throughput in the uplink also for the 5G was essentially the same. And the reason for that is that the uplink, the limitation does not become what network you are using or, 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 or the channel conditions themselves, but um, the limitation is now based on the hardware in your mobile, in your mobile network device, so in this case in our phone. Um, the hardware is the limitation because the antennas in, in, in the cell phone can only transmit a certain amount of maximum power, they can only use a certain type of modulation, so there is on the downlink more mobile networks use OFDM and yeah uh, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing um, or yeah multiple access OFDM A orthogonal frequency division multiple access whereas in the uplink um, they use OFDM A S C and that's orthogonal frequency division multiple access single carrier so much like um, that numerology I was talking about um, on the uplink mobile phones only have the capacity of using uh, single carrier whereas on the downlink you've got more compute power more electrical energy and more transmit power so that's where you realize that even though we have changed a lot of things on the uplink it's still pretty much the same because the limitation is now um, the hardware used to implement that on the mobile device. So yeah, you can see um, the 5G obviously with better performance than the 4G there. Our 5G test bed with a downlink of um, 90 megabits per second, approximately 90 megabits per second as compared to the commercial one which is 252 megabits per second. And yeah, the reason for this again is we're using an open source, we're using open source open air interface to implement these and they are still currently in the development stages although they have managed to implement much of the stuff for the non standalone they are, they are still working on uh, improving the throughputs there although yeah we, we did have better latency and that's probably to do with the channel conditions themselves this is an indoor test bed and it was done um, indoors whereas um, yeah with the antennas pretty close to the phone and all of that so that would affect the latency as well So yeah, let's move on to drone communication. We've covered mobile networks. So okay, uh, what do we do now that we've got uh, our own non-public mobile network running, right? Let's now go and fly the drone using that. And yeah, I'll just start with a bit of setup. So you've got a typical drone there. This is one of the drones that we used. And yeah, you've got your motors, you've got your GPS, we're using a year two GPS. You've got your electronic speed controllers, you've got your propellers, you've got your battery. And what we care about the most here for us in terms of communication is our telemetry module and the Cube Orange, which is our flight controller. It's an open source um, flight controller, PX4, PixHawk, called Cube, Cube Pilot. And yeah so essentially your direct link is the most common one you just fly your drone with your remote controller and yeah you can put payload data in there but the telemetry module would be used so a telemetry module is essentially just an antenna on the drone you would have um, an antenna attached to your laptop as well and the telemetry module there it's using 868 megahertz frequency and that's where you would transmit either your command uh your control data your like your command and control data as well as your payload data so like sensor information di di directly to your ground stations for so for the ground station we're using my um mission planner or q ground control these are all open source uh, drone ground control stations so yeah it's another slide just a bigger picture there 
So yeah, how do we make our drone a mobile network user equipment? The way I went about this is by attaching an, an, an onboard companion computer onto the drone. And um, we used a Raspberry Pi 3B Plus for this. And yeah, just attach it via USB to the autopilot itself. So now the Raspberry Pi can send commands to the autopilot and receive commands and receive um, commands con or, con or, or control information from the drone. So the autopilot PX4, which is your Q pilot, um, your autopilot is essentially now, you're now able to get access to it using the Raspberry Pi. From then on, we went to attach a Pi hat. So the Pi hat is on top of the Raspberry Pi. And yeah, the Pi hat um, essentially is what makes uh, the drone part of the mobile net, net network itself. The Pi hat comes with a SIM card that can connect to the mobile network. So yeah, so that's your setup there. Um, this is the drone that we used. Um, and just uh, to zoom in there, you'll see that we've got our flight controller there at the bottom. And this case here on top is our Raspberry Pi attached to the Pi hat. And yeah, we've got our five antennas there, um, essentially for mobile network communication. And yeah, so yeah, what does the full picture look like? The full picture looks something like this. We've got our 5G mobile network here, which is everything on the left which you will see that we went through, except that we only added mission planner. So the core network itself and the mission planner computer are the same computer. They are running on the on the same computer. And so, yeah, so on the right side, that's our mobile network. Um, yeah, and on the left side, we've got our drone and with the Pi, with the Pi hat there. So the Pi hat can go ahead and communicate to the mobile network and yeah all data is moved to and from so in, in terms of drones um there's a communication they use the communication protocol they used is called mavlink and that's almost the standard communication protocol used for open source drones and uh yeah that's what we were using here and we're using mavlink router and mavlink router is just a piece of software that enables you to route to listen to the autopilot so over here on the left on, on the left hand side yeah if you look we've got a mavlink router container which is dockerized um it listens to the px4 and, and 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 sends that information to a specific ip address and yeah anything that comes to this ip address as well it forwards it to the autopilot so mavlink router there and within the core network we have added into what is called the application layer of the core network. We've added a container, a dockerized container there called Mavlink Traffic Generation. And what that does is essentially also just an instance of Mavlink Router. So when anything comes to the core network, it's directly routed to the Mission Planner application or the Q Ground Control application, which is your ground control stations. And yeah, that's this is essentially it. This is how we 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 get our drone um, to communicate with our ground station via the mobile network. So you see here, we've got our red lines there, and that's essentially how traffic would move to and from the drone to your ground control station. Um, the red solid lines being your 5G, so from the pilot antenna to the 5G base station, to the core network, and, and to your mission planner application. And the red dotted lines, those are your, that shows the channel communication for the 4G. So the good thing about this is, like I said, our mobile networks are being backward compatible. And the fact that our mobile net, net, net networks has got, our mobile network has got um, 5G available as well as 4G so whenever it's flying whenever your drone is flying and you have got your 5G communication channel 
deteriorating or the ch channel conditions are not too great it will always back it will always revert back to 4g and 4g because of the frequencies that we're using um 4g is operating at a lower frequency than 5g and it's like the communication channel is is less uh susceptible to um to attenuation and uh, yeah 4g pretty much has got uh, a, a longer a longer range of, of communication as well so it, it will always interchange between the between the two uh depending on which one is the preferred or the better channel to use so yeah that's essentially it and what we've been able to do um or what i've been able to do with regards to this setup i have been able to pretty much uh, command and control the drone so i can arm and disarm the drone i can tell it to do an auto mission um yeah i, I can i can do all sorts of things it says essentially there is a full and proven communication to the drone using this and uh yeah it is it is great and yeah cur currently what we are what i'm working on is uh going onwards we're gonna do some bit of flight tests um so you know, the flight tests will include both the 4g and the 5g in our standalone mobile network and we're going to be measuring some drone communication key performance indicators and what this essentially will be is that um you know is using um a mobile network that much better and is it worth it uh throughout like uh you know is there a future there and as it stands with our indoor test beds that we have set up there definitely is a, f a, f a, f a future and the drone industry can definitely um gain a lot from what mobile networks have to offer and then yeah ultimately this will pave way for the 5g standalone test so the reason why we haven't used the standalone 5g mobile network is because yeah it's it's still under development and although it, it does exist um yeah the connection will only last a few seconds and um stuff that i had mentioned there like network slicing and beam forming and uh the low latency using different numerologies uh that's still currently being implemented and yeah it's the is the is the same is even in the commercial scene as well um commercial mobile network suppliers are currently only deploying the non standalone version but yeah so this um this set of experiments and uh vision will enable us to pave way for for 5g standalone tests and um really um leverage mobile networks for drone com communication and yeah just to mention yeah it would be good to see how from my from my current test which i'm which i have currently run i even put the data there because i'm still replicating those tests and um yeah making sure that i've got reliable data but yeah you can see that sometimes like when your drone is flying and let's say it's making a sharp movement because of the current draw of the propellers you will see that even your throughput is highly influenced by that in by that inter interference like your throughput might be at an average of 70 megabits per second and it just drops down to zero like when a drone is make, making a sharp turn or something like that so it's all it's all in interesting data to see and yeah i can't wait uh to really um finish these test flights and look into that so yeah that's me for today um yeah just uh, my acknowledgement i'd like to thank alfred peace loan foundation uh for sponsoring my master's degree and centex solutions for providing the radio equipment um, that i've been using for these experiments thank you so much thank you for your time and uh yeah thank you for your interest in my in my in my presentation as well if you need to know more um this is my name there and i'm available on linkedin and yeah which would be good if you have any questions 
I would have wanted to make the presentation in person, but yeah, there were some visa difficulties and um, yeah, uh, the, the visas were not processed quickly enough, but I would have been liked to be there in person and see everyone, especially after seeing um, the number of people we had booked to attend the slot. It would have definitely been good to see all of you um, in person and uh, yeah, talk about this and see what you have to say. But if you've got any questions or need further clarity, um, you can always um, look for me via that link and um, yeah, definitely get back to you. Thank you so much.